Hello, ladies and gentlemen, all three or four of you who remain. Can you, uh, before I start, this is Professor Hamamoto. How's the audio sound now? Please tell me in the uh, live chat. Great. I don't get it. Hello from Florida. Yes, Salty says yes. Okay, perfect, great. Thank you very much. I had to restart my computer. I'm glad that you stuck with it because it's going to be well worth your while. And uh, in the meantime, I can cut out a lot of the fat that I have built into the talk here. Okay. So today's talk is uh, Eclipse Anxiety, and it's the CERN crisis cult that we're going to be talking about specifically. And I was, I was as I was joking earlier, and you might not have been able to hear it because of the reverberations, but uh, I think I've happened upon a new syndrome, that is the notion of uh, eclipse anxiety, even though it's been going on since time immemorial. I think a more important insight here for today is uh, the notion of CERN, right? Do you know the facility in uh, the, it's on the Swiss-Belgian uh, border? And there are several CERN-like facilities all over the world, CERN, but the one we're talking about is associated with a lot of Hindu iconology and goddesses and statuary. And it had all those really creepy dancers in the opening ceremony of that, that uh, Gothard uh, tunnel, right? That's the CERN that I'm talking about today in specific. But CERN itself is emblematic of what I'm arguing is the crisis of science and technology, or as it's been talked about in the curriculum these days, K through 12, as well as the university curriculum, STEM for short, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And as I was, uh, the creepy dancer is great. I, I have to keep checking the, uh, the live stream to make sure that I'm coming across okay. Um, uh, let's see here. Where, where was I? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm stating that the CERN as such, even though it uh, hypes itself up, is uh, trying to find the so-called uh, Higgs boson, so-called God particle, and trying to unlock the, the riddles of the universe or the uh, cosmos. True, maybe, you know, maybe so, maybe not. But I think it's uh, function primarily right at this point now is to address the uh, growing public, I, maybe worldwide, but definitely in the United States of America or the English speaking world, let's say more broadly. But the growing disenchantment with so called STEM areas, right? In the US in particular, we've recently saw that uh, quote unquote accident, uh, that event that took down the uh, Francis Scott Key Bridge in the port of Baltimore, right? With the uh, ship, the container ship called the Dali, as in Salvador Dali. And he's uh, he was the king of uh, surrealism, right? I <laughs> uh, wonder if that was an accident or not. Um, that's a hypothetical question because it probably was not. But uh, you, you get my, my drift here. We're having doors and parts of falling off of aircraft in midair and all kinds of incredible... Um, uh, I don't know how long ago it's been now, but remember the, the train that derailed carrying some kind of unknown toxic uh, uh, fumes or I don't know what. I'm not going to guess. Be, you know, if you know, feel free to put it in the comments. But uh, it's reminiscent of that book, that Don Nolilo book, right, about the the uh, toxic events. Right. So um, example upon example compounded upon compounded, right? And we're seeing a generalized anxiety uh, as a result of this. And we're having pre-post-traumatic uh, stress trauma, perhaps, because of that's all we've been hit with since, uh, since 2001, right? Maybe even further, but 2001, 9-11, it's been almost to an unremitting series of crises and uh, uh, big events, if if you want to call it, including the big bio event of the past few years, and I'm not going to be any more specific than that. So the science community, and that includes the medical community, 
um, is facing a fundamental challenge to its legitimacy. It's called a, a legitimacy or legitimation crisis. Um, and a social thinker by the name of Habermas, Jürgen Habermas, ref was referring more specifically to capitalism, the crisis of capitalism. It's always undergoing uh, problems, and it has to come up with new forms of legitimation, right? Um, but I'm not restricting that critique to capital. I'm, I'm talking more specifically about the crisis of science itself. Why else are we being hit bombarded with an unremitting propaganda effort as it concerns science. Scientific American, the, the magazine, to Atlantic magazine, all of them, the popular journals, uh, the fiction even, science fiction has become sort of um, a handmaid to the ecological crisis, uh, pornography, um, on and on and on. I read that as a sign of weakness, not to the triumph of the vaunted scientific rationality that was supposed to uh, bring together all these great technologies for the betterment of humanity, right? And we've read all any number of dystopian novels, fictions, and seen the different movies. I don't have to run them down from uh, 1984 to uh, Brave New World, right? The Huxley. He was actually celebrating it. When I was a kid, I thought he was... Uh, he was um, parroting it or criticizing it worse, but he was in a way ringing it in. And he figures into this critique of CERN as a crisis cult because of his uh, interest in um, universal religion, right? They called it the perennial religion. And that's the religion of CERN. And it has nothing to do with the Christianity. It has nothing to do with Judaism. It has nothing to do with the great monotheistic religions, you know, such as Islam. Um, what it is uh, has been detailed in any number of uh, academic books primarily, and I'm, I'm really heartened by the fact that there's been an explosion of literature. And that's why I'm saying non-Marxist perspectives, because that the Marxian perspectives, which includes critical race theory, uh, queer theory, so-called, and so-called the offshoots, the Black Lives Matter, are offshoots of Marxism. And they have retarded the exploration of what I believe is the antidote to our, our lopsided understanding of reality, which is a materialist one. It's a materialist in the Marxist sense, but right? only looking at economic forces. And it's materialist in the sense of the science, right? The STEM philosophical materialism to the um, detriment of the occult, of the esoteric tradition, right? Here's one example. This guy happens to be a independent, and I'm showing these books because one of the criticisms I get is that, oh, uh, well, you're just pulling these ideas out of your arse, right? No, no, this, this material here, although it sounds spontaneous because I don't rehearse this, and um, I don't script my lectures. Um, I never did, never did in the academic world because uh, as a student, I knew how boring that is, right? Um, but anyway, his name is Gordon uh, Jerjevic. I'm mispronouncing his name, no doubt. But this book's called India and the Occult, subtitled The Influence of South Asian Spirituality on Modern Western Occultism, right? And there's a chapter, and I'm going to go through a couple of books, not, you know, in the, in totality, but just to give you an overview of what I'm bringing to this party here. This chapter here is very important. It's chapter five, Secrets of Typhonian Tantra, subtitled Kenneth Grant and the Western Occult Interpretations of Indian Spirituality. Notice the key word interpretations, and I take that to mean also misinterpretations or misappropriations of what Hinduism is, for example. And uh, it all started around, I think, the time of the Huxleys and the Bloomberg School. I think it started amongst the uh, London intelligentsia as early as the late uh, 19th century. And I think it's part mostly because of the uh, colonial contact of the British Empire with the uh, Indian subcontinent where scholars and um, 
priests and uh, colonial administrators came into contact with uh, these diverse uh, religious traditions and um, translated some of the books and the scripture and brought it back to the West. I'm really, really simplify oversimplifying it here. But in the same sense, CERN and the cult of science scientists have are also uh, distorting and oversimplifying and and really politicizing their worldview which is warped it's one-sided right this is without um, uh, jumping too far ahead is what is really at the source of the what I call it the eclipse crisis or the perennial crises that we're facing right now. Um, and yeah, I guess it might have a, a lot to do with um, what some people say in the religious community, saying that we've turned our uh, away from God, and uh, this is some form of uh, punishment, or this is what happens when we forget our um, our uh, religious, our spiritual grounding that made all of this uh, wondrous science and technology possible in the first place. Uh, there's a lot of um, the validity in that argument. Now, I've given talks on people who have been propounding that, and I won't rehearse it right now. But before we get underway, um, I want you to memorize or jot down, and you know, maybe I'll come back to this in a, in a future talk, a theorem, right? I say it's more of an axiom because... When you say theorem, you think about mathematics, right? But this is a social scientific theorem or axiom. It's axiomatic, right? And it's called, but in the literature, it's called the Thomas Theorem. And it's named after a guy named W.Y. Thomas and his wife, Dorothy Swain Thomas, for those of you who want to check it out. Uh, W.Y. Thomas... Uh, um, co-authored or helped to bring to print this book called The Polish uh, Peasant, just for you nerds in sociology by Florian Zanecki. Um, and this is, and I'm mentioning this because the, the Marxian perspective has, has blotted out that entire tradition in sociology. Um, I'm not saying I'm trying to revive it single-handedly, but uh, I think we need to revisit some of these uh, thinkers that that don't derive from Nar Marx, and in fact, they're the sworn enemies of of Marx, and that's why you only hear some variant of Marxism in in the university. I mentioned Vil uh, Vilfredo Pareto uh, at, at the last talk, but there are many, many others. Max Weber, on and on and on. But this is not a a talk on sociological theory. But I'm saying that that the the Thomas theorem should be internalized by all of us here on a practical level. Here, here it is, here it is. And I'm going to repeat it three times. Here it goes. If men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. Again, if men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. Finally, and I'm going to slightly modify, if people, if you want neutral language, if people or if individuals define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. So what does that mean? It means that if there's a, a group of people or even individuals who think that the world is going to end on uh, April 8th, that's tomorrow, Monday, then their actions, their behavior might very well be influenced by their subjective understanding of what's going on in the universe with the solar phenomena, the uh, the the solar eclipse that um, that uh, we're going to all be treated, not all of us, but uh, much of the United States is going to be treated to tomorrow. I'm, where I'm in, I'm only going to see 20% of it. And uh, I doubt if I'll even go outside to, to check it out because... Um, 20% is not very much, but if you're in that that uh, totality uh, highway, then maybe it's it's worth checking out. Um, so if if people define this this crisis as being real, it's going to be real to them. And that's all the propagandists, that's all the um, the uh, manipulators, the social contingent 
contagion manufacturers, that the advertisers, the PR people, that's all they have to know. All they have to do is to get a critical mass uh, to buy into this uh, idea. Situa the situation is being real and um, it has consequences. It has social action. It has behavioral consequences, right? Um, some of them purport to be good, right? good effects. For example, I've read several articles in preparation for this talk that witnessing the solar eclipse is going to bring a, an unprecedented um, intensity of social cohesion amongst Americans. Now, is this organic social, social co cohesion or is it cohesion that CERN wants to see, right, or the scientific establishment? And I'm not anti-science, by the way. I hope you under you know understand that. But the CERN people want, and then and all the people who are related to this eclipse project, including the universities and the governments, local municipal municipalities, Department of Homeland Security, CERN itself, and NASA, right? They want us to believe that they are the totemic entities that are making this all possible for us to experience to feel this sense of wholeness and of integration that uh, Carl Gustav, uh, Gustav Jung wrote about, right? When he wrote about UFOs and about solar events and about, um, about alchemy, he talks about man's, and this is Jung, I don't necessarily agree with, with all of it, but poetically it, it rings true <laughs> about the shadow self, the shadow person, and uh, the duality in human beings and how these phenomena, including UFO observation, uh, brings this sense of unity that, that human beings, according to him, um, want, we desire, we live for it. And I'll leave it up to you to decide whether um, Jung had it right or not, whether that's true. But um, for most of us, we don't like to leave uh, puzzles right? If you see a jigsaw puzzle, you're always tempted to kind of figure it out, put it together. We like that, those types of intellectual challenges. We like physical challenges. We like the sense of an ending. We like completion. That's why we don't like Netflix drama, because they lead us on and on and on, and there's no payoff, right? But we like um, serials, right? S-E-R-I-E. ALS. We like to be continued, and but we want resolution, right? Aristotle, the poetics, where you want some catharsis, right? Whether you believe in that aesthetic theory or not, or if you're a postmodernist and you don't want to give people the happy endings, well, that's that's another discussion, that's right? So if men define situations as real, they're real in their consequences. That's why I'm talk, tackling this hackneyed subject of uh, the the solar eclipse right um before i go on um i showed a little bit before i had to restart this uh, cast here but uh, i want to show you a little bit of uh, the greg reese take on this um, phenomenon he does excellent work you would be advised to uh, check out his uh, his own site it's the reese report there are any number of very short succinct to the point, uh, think pieces that run from, you know, three to five minutes. And they're perfect for for um, for our purpose here today. Let's take a, uh, another look at it. It's not going to be long because I want you to watch the whole thing on your own. The solar eclipse on April 8th is becoming a major event. The National Guard is being deployed and the people are being advised to have two weeks of food and to fill their fuel tanks. This could all be explained due to the fact that tens of thousands of visitors are expected along the path of totality. But many people believe that they could be preparing for possible earthquakes due to the Devil Comet aligning with the April 8th eclipse and due to the fact that in 1811, a comet also appeared in the skies during a solar eclipse on the same path and was followed by the biggest earthquakes in American history. Known as the New Madrid earthquakes, 
Around 10,000 earthquakes occurred in just three months' time, the biggest being measured at 8.8 .8 magnitude. They were the most devastating series of earthquakes in recorded history. But it was a different comet, and while some claim that a solar eclipse can trigger earthquakes, this scenario seems unlikely. This eclipse season is, however, a very rare event. The recent eclipses in August of 2017 and October of 2023, along with the upcoming one on April 8th, forms an Aleph and a Tav over the United States. The Aleph and Tav are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. These eclipse tanks. This could all that yes. tens of thousands the, of visitors. The, 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 the solar alpha. eclipse on April eighth. Trying to, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> the alpha and the omega. It sounds ominous, right? But again, um, go back to the uh, the Thomas theorem. If men define situations as, re as real, they are real in their consequences. And the scientific shaman class, those who are grouped around the CERN hype, and I have no doubt that they're doing wondrous uh, experiments that we're, we're reading about, but a lot of it is hype, just like there was a lot of NASA hype. And it's not coincidence that NASA is involved with the current uh, solar eclipse hype uh, that's going on here, right? Some people are even questioning, and I'm not saying where I stand on it, um, are questioning whether NASA really truly had a space program and what were all those Nazis doing down in uh, down in Alabama anyway, right, With the, under Dr. Werner von Braun. So on and on it goes. Right, and this is where where the sociology and the anthropology can help us think through these um, these these forms of um, of manipulation of mass social psychological manipulation. Uh, they might have some grounding in reality. We do know that uh, the moon and the celestial activity has has a, a impact on the Earth's gravity. Right, maybe. We're going to be more prone to uh, earthquakes if some comet comes back uh, in, into our into our sphere here, right? We 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 know this; it's been written about. It's uh, you know ad nauseum cross culturally. People have have noted this from India to to the uh, Western world, uh, going back um, centuries, right? But let's return more specifically to CERN because that's something that we can visually wrap our mind around and it's very much in the news because they are relentless self promoters of uh, their efforts. And again, I think it's coming not out of strength, not because they think that they have finally found the key to understanding the physical universe, but they're doing it because they realize there's growing public uh, skepticism of the entire enterprise of science, including CERN itself, right? So the, the solution in, in their mind is PR. It's more Bernaysian type of mind warpage that they do. So that's weakness. It's also weakness in, in, in the school system, relentlessly pushing STEM to the detriment of the social sciences and to the detriment of, of the arts, Performing arts, studio arts, literature, the written arts, spoken arts, right? Lopsided, because that type of hegemonic control of the CERN worldview, the godhead, Shiva, the goddess, is perfect for this centralized world government that they've been, they, meaning these technocrats, have been trying to push us to for um close to 150 years. I can't put exact time on it. And people like Huxley, who I already mentioned, uh, were, were very much part of that. The family, going back three generations, right, were very much involved with this project. And it's no accident that Huxley himself was uh, very much a um, perennial philosophy. It's called One Religion Man. 
right? It's not Christianity. It's not Judaism. It's not Islam. It's not one of the great monotheistic religions. It's just sort of this pantheistic uh, perennial religion that supposedly mankind is, that unites all of humanity. So it has this sort of utopian uh, tinge to it, but really it's it's the religion of globalists. It's the religion of technocrats. It's the religions of Cernians, C-E-R, and I just coined a new term, right? And I know it's going to be difficult for you to, to accept my critique at this point, but it's grounded in the literature, a classic and growing literature now of, um, of studies in the occult, studies in esotericism, uh, studies in, in, um, in non-rational, I'm not saying irrational, but non-empirical modes of knowledge, which science, the Cernians, emphasizes to the detriments of all other forms of knowledge. Right. And Marxism falls very much into that camp. They call it, they used to call it scientific socialism. What they, and Marx referred to himself as a philosophical materialist. They do not admit the reality of God. Right. In any way, shape, or form, the only, uh, unit of analysis that they're interested in is is, is uh, capitalism versus labor. <laughs> but they can't really break out. And, and, and unfortunately, that's what the academia is locked into this framework. But the good news, it's beginning to change. And it's changing because of thinkers like uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jurdovic, who's writing about India and the occult, and looking about people, looking at People like figures like Kenneth Grant. Let me read just briefly here to put it in historical perspective. Kenneth Grant, 1924 to 2011, was a British writer on occult subjects who was primarily known for developing an idiosyncratic interpretation of the work of Aleister Crowley, 1875-1947. And this whole chapter goes deep, more deeply into it. Uh, it's a short but very dense book. Thank you, my patrons, for allowing me to buy this. This is an academic monograph. It costs $100. They're expensive. And I'm not just saying that to tout um, my ability, thanks to the patrons, to buy these books, but to point out the fact that most of what you are hearing about Hermeticism and Gnosticism is YouTube material. It's really, and, and on all these different websites, it's really low level almost moronic type of uh, pop religiosity, right? That has repulsed me for ever since I started seriously myself studying comparative religion back um, in probably the late 60s. And um, I remember the first book I bought, it was so important to me. Uh, A.C. Bosquet, I think his name is, it was called Comparative Religion, right? But now, and that fell to the wayside with the Marxians, uh, taking over academia through 60s, 70s, 80s, and up to the present. Uh, it's changing, though. Here's an anthology, because people want to know. They want a book list from me. I don't have time to create a bibliography, so just take notes of this. Gnosis and Hermeticism, From Antiquity to Modern Times, edited, edited by Rolf von der Berg. Um, I apologize. I don't know his work. I should although I'm not an expert in this area. But I do know the work of his co-editor, Wouter J. Hanegraaff, and he teaches at uh, the University of, um, oh my gosh, it's in Sweden. Let's see, let me see what it says in the back. Gothenburg, yeah. He's one of the, the, the movers and shakers in this renewal in academia of non-Marxian non uh, they're not rejecting Marxism as such, but they said we want to understand social, cultural, political realities out, uh, beyond the, uh, the strictures that have been imposed by this boneheaded critical theory, right, of, of Marxism that we're seeing now. And he's going to, and this could benefit all the disciplines outside of science, and it could benefit science. There's a great chapter here that I'm not going to read out of, but uh, there's an illustration. Uh, this is a chapter on William Blake. This whole approach of understanding 
the occult and the esoteric can revolute can revitalize literary studies which has been locked into gay theory queer theory for the last 30 years and it which is an offshoot of marxian theory um critical theory so-called frederick jameson who i've heard speak in person right he was a close friend of one of my professors he taught at uc san diego by the way um was is one of the key figures here so i i know their work and i know the trajectory and i know the damage that he, they have inflicted not just within academia but in the larger society and there is a very strong technocratic bias within that form of thinking it comes from the idea of, of marxian philosophy as being materialist right um philosophical materialist not looking at the the um the romantic traditions right with a capital r and they're certainly not going to be looking at the gnostic tradition hermeticism to find out what the hell cern is about right F find some kind of uh, marxist cultural critic you know they're all over the place uh, they're public intellectuals right uh, what's his name um can't think of anybody off and usually they're they're more like neoliberals right now but there were tons of um i don't know if i yeah any, anyway i'm not going to name check any of these people right now it's it's really uh here nor here nor there but you're not going to get any answers from them but you will get answers from these texts here you'll get answers from uh, a book i consulted titled the the routledge handbook of religion and secrecy right uh, Marxist uh, theoreticians don't like to talk about religion, right? They're materialists. They have very little appreciation or grasp of it. Um, if they did, they'd really be dangerous. But uh, to our advantage, they um, they skirt over it. They think, oh, we're, we'll outgrow it. It's just a form of a childish thinking. And uh, once the revolution is in place, uh, we'll have a... Um, We'll have a complete secular state. It comes out of the tradition of the um, the uh, the French Revolution. They overthrew the monarchy, but they also threw overthrew the uh, the state or the church. Right, that's their big revolution. Same with the Soviet Revolution. They got rid of the church and they went back to it. And now Russian society is thriving more than ever. Maybe there's a maybe we can learn from the Russians instead of. Um, uh, baiting them all the time, not us, not you, not me, but uh, the retired colonels who want to make sure that they can supplement their uh, munificent uh, pensions by consulting for these um, armaments manufacturers and gun runners. Uh, and by the way, the United Nations um, uh, voted um, overwhelmingly to uh, look to uh, launch an investigation into war crimes of people here in the United States uh, so far as uh, their supplying of armaments to uh, uh, the Israeli Defense Force, the IDF. Uh, this, so there's some good news here, right? The, universe, the United Nations is part of this globalist problem, but within themselves, there's some self-policing mechanisms that are to be encouraged instead of just saying, oh, you know, damn the UN, damn this, damn the and just get rid of it all. Well, they're, they're, in this case, it seems to be maybe they have a, a, um, a hidden agenda behind it that I'm not aware of. You know, they 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 do that sometimes. <clears throat> One of the other thinkers that you can deal with is his name's Hugh Irvin, who writes on uh, religion. I predict there's going to be a resurgence in the in religious studies and the studies of these esoteric traditions, including esoteric Judaism, esoteric Christianity. Buddhism already has that kind of covered. Uh, but again, it's usually pop Buddhism, right? Um, I I get um, people telling me all the time that, uh, you know, I need to, to uh, study this particular Buddhist thinker or I need to study this yoga or something. You know, um, that's not what I'm talking about. That's pop yoga. That's pop Buddhism, right? And no offense to the people here who are listening who invested in a yoga mat and yoga pants and you take yoga lessons once a week. You know, I don't mean to um, denigrate you. I think any type of physical 
and spiritual exercise is good for you. It's just inherently good, what whatever it might be. But that's not the type of yoga that these guys are writing about, right? You can have your pop yoga, but you can't have um, the study of tantric yoga in the university. I, I taught it. I lectured. Not that I'm an expert, but I talked about how sexuality was intrinsic to certain religious traditions, such as Hindu, because I taught a, a course in uh, Asian American sexuality specifically, and I and I had a, a section, a lecture on that. And again, I don't speak out of any sense of expertise. These are highly specialized forms of inquiry that we're talking about, but they're forms of inquiry that we regular people, uh, our, you know, laymen can, can benefit by, right? So these are all non-Marxist perspectives that are going to help us to understand, pick apart and create and critique these people who think that, that they have uh, God capacity that the work at CERN, right? And they do it by appropriating, misappropriating, I should say, misappropriating Hinduism. Here's an example. A two-meter statue of the Shiva dance, Natraj, was presented at CERN, the European Center for Particle Physics Research in Geneva. The statue, which symbolizes the cosmic dance of the creation and destruction of Shiva, was delivered to CERN by the Indian government to celebrate the long association of the research center with India. The author Frijov Kepra first drew a parallel between the dance of Shiva's creation and destruction and the dance of subatomic particles in the Tao of physics. It quotes, modern physics had shown that the rhythm of creation yeah, I remember that was a big book. Um, I don't know. I think back in the 70s, it was called The Tao of Physics. And this is where so-called, quote unquote, Eastern or the misappropriation of Eastern religions was wedded to the technocratic vision, the techno-fascism we've seen embodied in the CERN project and other infrastructure, controlling infrastructure, including communications, right? Um, the right that 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 connect that intersect with the um, the whole communications grid, including uh, wireless communications. I'm not going to go any further than that because I don't want to start echoing again. <laughs> All right, but there was this figure. His name was a Frigitov, uh Copper, I think it was. I can't. I'm mispronouncing his name. I don't know what his background was, but he was a pop physicist. Right? We we get this all the time, over and over again. Right? And we've seen this misappropriate. So that's what CERN. That's how they're operating. In addition to the misappropriation of so-called Eastern religions, their appropriation of it. Um. There, they've also, as I previously, and I want to underscore this. I, I suspect that they're very much uh, influenced by just for the sake of convenience, I'll call it Crowleyanism. They're very much influenced by, by Alistair Crowley and the, and his, his uh, exponents, his pro his, his disciples, right. And um, throw in a little bit of theosophy and you have throw a little bit of new age and you have voila, you have CERN. Right. And it's good. It's again, I'm saying it's undergoing a crisis. So let me step back and define what a crisis cult is. I call CERN a crisis cult. Okay. If you'll allow me to talk a little bit about my own academic career, I'm part of the story. I know some of you hate it when you hear a yellow person talking about themselves, right? Unless he's a chef or a physicist, right? But I'm telling you, I, I had the, the honor of studying with an eminent anthropologist, cultural anthropologist by the name of Joseph G. Jorgensen. Um, he was the author of a book, let's see, when was it published? 1972, when I was still in college when this credible monograph was, was published by the University of Chicago Press. It's an academic book. <clears throat> 
It's a classic, and it's called uh, Sundance Religion. Sundance Religion. And the subtitle is Power for the Powerless. And Professor Jorgensen, who I took a couple of courses from, um, by that time he was very much disenchanted with the um, the academic uh, scene because theory, quote unquote, was coming in, right? GLBTQ hadn't come in yet, but the neo-Marxist theoretical takeover of the university was starting to come in. It was pushing out classical sociology and anthropology, even though Jorgensen, Professor Jorgensen himself was a leftist. He told me when he was a young, he was a member of the, the Trotsky, his Trotskyist faction, right? Which is a, the faction that lost out in the Bolshevik revolution, the Russian revolution, right? And Trotsky was exiled to, um, to well, he went all over the place, but he wound up in uh, Mexico, Coyacan to be specific. Because I visit Casa Trotsky. <laughs> it's in Coyacan. Coyacan is also where it's a Casa Kahlo. As in Frida Kahlo. We know the artist, German, Mexican artist, and her husband, Diego Rivera. Right? So I've been these places. So anyway, he was a Trotskyist. And, and, and so he was a leftist, but he was still not on board with the, the new... The, the new forms of criticism that were very much materialistic, philosophical materialist after Marx himself. So his ethnography had to do with uh, the tribal culture where he grew up. He didn't grow up in a tribal culture. He's a, by religion, by upbringing, he was a Mormon and he grew up in Utah, state of Utah, where they did a lot of nuclear experimentation, by the way, Professor Jorgensen, uh, eventually succumbed to, I believe, uh, problems that were related to his exposure to above-ground nuclear experimentation. He was what they call a downwinder up there in Utah. He had all kinds of health problems. By the time I met him, and they continued to mount uh, before he um, passed away. But anyway, getting back to the book itself, it talks about a one one specific crisis cult that he studied eth ethnographically as an anthropologist, as a field anthropologist. And the crisis, and I'm really simplifying here, the crisis, <clears throat> what a crisis cult is, is that it's a reaction to the general loss of meaning, of purpose, when an entire way of life is destroyed. The economic infrastructure is wiped out, let's say, by the decimation of uh, the buffaloes or the traditional food supply, right? The cutting off of food supply that's taking place, by the way, to us here in the United States, we Americans, right? A lot of talk about food, uh, the uh, supply chain. We have uh, Bill Gates buying up all that agricultural property, right? Example after example, I don't have to uh, belabor that. But the point is, getting back to it, this is, and I'm oversimplifying, this is what happens when a way of life that could be generations um, old uh, reaches the point of um, of uh, desperation, right? And they'll go to war. Uh, they'll go into uh, incredibly painful uh, masochistic, we might call it rituals, so they can endure pain, the pain of battle and sacrifice in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Or they'll devise new new forms of magical practice, like, a, let's say, a breastplate made of bones that are supposed to uh, ward off the bullets of the, uh, the U.S. Army cavalry, right? And rituals and dances, right? This, this is the sun dance, he calls it the Sundance religion. You got to read the book. Okay. I'm just sorry. Or, or at bottom, look at, I don't usually like to recommend to you, but look on you, it, YouTube for Sundance religion, right? There's, there's still some, some remainder of that. That's what he called this. It was a Sundance religion. It was a messianistic. They were going to be rescued. The Buffalo would return and on and on. It has a very, um, recognizable flavor, doesn't it? Because we've had uh, Kiliastic cults and uh, Messianic cults also. 
Um, am I having audio problems? Because I'm getting a phone call. It says Don, Mike, in some ways. Hopi. Yeah, there's someone put Hopi cults. I'm going to just let it ring. If I'm if you're having audio problems, let me know. Then I'll I'll cut the uh, transmission. Okay, the audio is perfect. Okay, did I uh, exhaust that topic enough? Probably. You just read it. So, okay, are you following my my argument here? It's kind of convoluted, I know. My argument is that CERN and the whole complex that around itself is a crisis cult. It is a it is a cult of science that's in crisis. I think there's a growing number of people within that community itself that are having severe self doubt, right? Second thoughts, if you will, about their enterprise, right? Have any of you uh, been part of a profession or been a job in a job situation where you did say, "Hey, I didn't sign up for this." Yeah, this is all, all of a sudden it's kind of kind of turned weird, you know, or you've been to a party, you know, and all of a sudden uh, people start disappearing and only a bunch of freaks are left. And that's called a mansion party. <laughs> right. That's when the cocaine hangs out, uh, starts coming out and all the real freaky material you know, that's in the news right now. This goes on in all the professions, by the way. Right. I never stayed myself. I never stayed for the after party. That's why my uh, my academic career only could reach a certain level, All right? You know what an after party is? Look it up on Tubi. It's good for something. It's usually a bunch of boneheads talking about it. You know, it's something that they they read or heard about. But it is a thing. The after party, the mansion party, it's a reality, right? But anyway, the point is, is that I think there's a crisis of faith, if you will, amongst the practitioners of, uh, themselves, right? There is also a crisis amongst the worker bees who are not PhDs in physics from the top universities around the world, but um, they've got a degree in computer science or something related, right, in mathematics, and they went to work for Apple thinking that it's a safe job. Well, did you read the news lately? And I'm not gloating over this. Far from it. Uh, Apple just laid off another 600 workers. These are highly skilled, trained labor, right? Now, I know the Marxists are going to come and see. We told you so. The, the, the fall of capitalism is imminent because now the tech sector is dropping. Well, crisis is embedded in every social system, in every society. So is totemism. All cultures, all societies periodically go through crises. Um, not all survive crises. I don't know. If, you know, there's no predicting whether uh, American society has it within itself to uh, to survive the manufactured crises that we're going through, and it's manufactured definitely. So, is that point being made? If it's not made, let me. Um, Cite one more article, it's a, it's a more recent article. The Jorgensen book is 72. This is a more recent one, but it uses a similar framework for analysis. And it's by an individual named uh, uh, John W. Connor. And it was published in 1989 in a journal called Ethos. And the title is From Ghost to Dance to death camps, subtitled Nazi Germany as a Crisis Cult, right? It's a good article. I'll post it on my Patreon. I can't go through it right now because it's it's too long and involved, and I would really be shortchanging the, the uh, observations. But anyway, this thinker is extending. I'm not saying he's reading Jorgensen, but I'm saying Jorgensen, who wrote about the Sundance religion, who wrote about the ghost dance, who wrote about crisis cult specifically in his own work, and that's how it was introduced to me uh, as a graduate student. And this person here is talking about Nazism in general is, is a response to um, 
these enormous problems that were that were characteristic of the Weimar Republic, that is the form of government that preceded the Third Reich, Weimar, right? Hyperinflation, joblessness, uh, bank closing, um, licentiousness. Berlin was the vice capital of the world. You had writers like Christopher Isherwood, maybe W.H. Hodd and some other uh, depraved, uh, well-to-do, comparatively speaking, Englishman that went over to Berlin to have sex with young boys, right? This is Berlin. This is in the 20s. Uh, we're seeing similar forms of um, sexual squalor here in the U.S. And the, the, I don't have to tell you about the sex trade and the trafficking in here in the United States. And uh, Isherwood, by the way, settled in uh, uh, Pacific Palisades up here on the west side of uh, Los Angeles along with a lot of expats like a Thomas Mann of, uh, who left Weimar, left, he saw it was, what was coming down. Are we going to let that happen again here in America? No. But the thing is that we're looking for sexy Nazis to take over. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's not going to be guys in jackboots wearing Ugo Boss uniforms. It's going to be people in these white smocks who um, like to play with needles and... Um, I won't say any more than that. And like to think big thoughts at uh, these uh, research facilities all over the world, not just at CERN, but at the universities. But I'm saying that I think some of them are having um, uh, second thoughts about uh, their enterprise. And certainly the public in general is having um, vocally becoming more um, aggressive in articulating their reservations. Just one book. I'm, I have tons of these similar to the theme here. This one is by a fellow named Joe Allen. It's called Dark Eon. And the subtitle is Transhumanism and the War Against Humanity. Right, the forward, forward is by Steve Bannon. I don't care what you, or doesn't matter what you think about him. You know, he, he's, uh, he's got his head screwed on straight in certain matters, right? So are, almost 500 pages of a critique. Anyway, I won't read you the bona fides of, um, of uh, Joe Allen, but anyway, the people who are responsible for the hegemonic system of, uh, of science, STEM, are very much aware of this literature, and they're trying desperately to figure out how to counter it and how to blunt it, and how to turn, keep the public in awe of, of uh, their mission, right? And um, I won't articulate what their mission is, but I think it has something to do with Luciferianism. That's my personal, um, and I'm not alone in, the, alone in that. That's my personal understanding, to put it very simply. And, <clears throat> and again, I am oversimplifying here. Right, that's that is their mission. Why else would they they be uh, trying to challenge uh, solar phenomenon, or try to put it put the sun in, in its technocratic shadow? And the Greeks had a you know, <clears throat> the ancient Greeks had a term for it. They call it hubris. Hubris. It's this arrogance that human beings have. Maybe it's universal. Maybe it's innate. I don't know. I'm not smart enough to really generalize about it, but it's it's this this idea that we can conquer everything. It's that's good in a sense, right? We want to solve puzzles, riddles, conundrums, right? We like these types of challenges, right? That's part of a humanity. But the other part of it is is that we want to master it, control it, right? And that's what really what techno Marxism is all about. That's what all the, the various offshoots are. They're providing a simplistic so solution to the crisis that's much deeper. And the frameworks, the analytical frameworks to get us out of the situation are being crowded out by these cancel people, the cancel culture. But again, I don't want to leave you on that negative note. It's beginning to change. The literature is beginning to grow in these areas, right? These are just some of the books that I'm reading right now, but there's ton, tons of other ones. 
So think about think about CERN as a crisis cult. Think about the notion of the crisis cult itself uh, that the anthropologists like Joseph Jorgen had given us to understand some of these these movements, right? And of course, cultists themselves never conceive that they themselves have fallen for the trap of cultism, right? Me, a cult member? No, not at all, right? I gave a talk on um, on uh, the so-called Manson family and how uh, the intelligence agencies have very much sussed out how cult behavior operates, how to work, and how to deploy it for their own purposes, right? And again, they are drawing from the extensive behavioral science, literature, psychology, uh, cognitive science, all of that has been has been uh, sifted through in order to order to make sure that this this cult of expertise of scientific expertise remains unquestioned, right? Now, as the tech sector continues to shed people in Silicon Valley, uh, the CERN people, DARPA people, uh, UNATO are are, are going to have, have a serious, even more deepening crisis of legitimacy. How they respond to that, I think we're seeing it right now with the Eclipse because they want to uh, take credit for kind of controlling it and monitoring it and providing protective services to the public, the Department of Homeland Security. And by the way, the former head of the Department of Homeland Security was my boss at one point at the University of California. Her name's Janet Napolitano. Sorry for talking about myself, but uh, I'm kind of uh, like, uh, you know, the zealot of history. I'm, I, I come in contact with with these characters that you only read about, right? Janet Napolitano was the president of the University of California. She came right in from the DHS. And she's overlooking Los Alamos. She's looking at all overlook. She was overseeing all the the research laboratories, all these brilliant phys physicists up at the University of California, Berkeley. Right, all of that. Right, but but these um, institutions are uh, quaking. Right, they're quaking because of the personnel that are the personnel that are uh, coming under uh, closer scrutiny and attack by books that I mentioned. Right. And we have reached the situation where we've um, developed some sort of a death camp culture, a death camp social psychology, right? And uh, this is not hype. If we don't want it here, we want it in the countries that we're supplying arms to in tons of money. It could be, you know, the Ukraine, for example. So again, because I, I want you to, to take this point away with you from this talk here that admittedly is somewhat disjointed, right? But here's the abstract of, of the article by Professor Connor from Ghost Dance to Death Camps. Here's the abstract. I'm not going to read all of it. <clears throat> um, in an attempt to understand the rise of Nazi Germany within the context of anthropological definition of culture, that is the total way of life of the people, the Nazi experience is compared with crisis cults or revitalization movements within other cultures, for example, the ghost dance of the Sioux Indians. When the ordered reality of a culture is disrupted, the fragility of the culture is manifested through mass hysteria and panic. A psychological reaction to stress is regression to more infantile forms of thinking. There is a loss of ego autonomy, increased anxiety, impulsivity, and a tendency towards magical thinking. In a situation like this, a charismatic leader appeals to the infantile needs of the followers <coughs> and promises them security, order, and structure. And that would be Adolf Rothschild Hitler. Excuse me a moment. That's a lot to uh, digest, comparing crisis calls to the Third Reich, because we like to think it's something apart from us. It's what those bad people did over there, and it can't happen here. That's not what we do as Americans, 
right? That's not we what we do as as Germans. This is not we do what we do as Englishmen. This is not we do it as Israelis or as Japanese. We don't do that. Only Nazis do it. I'm being facetious, of course. It's not true. It's in the heart of uh, of of all these um, uh, groups, these na national groups. But it's something we can guard against. And we're seeing the United Nations is taking some dramatic step. Of course, the United Nations vetoed it, along with the people they're paying off for with quote unquote foreign aid. And there's, I think, 13 nations abstained, which is like as much as be, but 28 nations. Um, voted to go ahead with this uh, uh, Committee on Human Rights investigation or, or, or initiative. So this is what happens when the society breaks down. Uh, we're going through such a, uh, a, a situation right now and in, in the, in the, um, the impending eclipse of tomorrow is being appropriated for the benefit of these institutions that want to shore up the um, faith of the faithless, right? That is not the faithless in terms of religion, but the people who are losing their faith, they're losing their religion of science, of the technocracy. Okay. Um, let me move to... Um, a larger point here, because you're saying, well, listen, they're, and I'm reading these articles too, they're saying that this is an opportunity for us to uh, to hold hands and have a kumbaya moment amongst total strangers in public, right? And sure enough, this, the literature that I read in preparing, preparing for this talk is that social cohesion does indeed seem to measurably intensify according to some sociologists, anthropologists that looked at, during times of um, these eclipses and uh, the most recent phenomenon, 2017, this is what they found. People will, and this is also in the popular magazine articles, people will cry. They'll, they'll stand there speechless, gobsmacked, in awe, right? Which is all well and good, but... Who's going to take credit for bringing together all the people in in a time where we're fragmented by race, gender, nationality, all of it? I mean, even the uh, the WNBA and the uh, women's division of the NCAA basketball is polarized along racial lines. So who's going to bring about the social cohesion? It's going to be the eclipse. And who is the person who's bringing it to us? The priesthood of DHS, Department of Homeland Security, the priesthood of CERN. Just like in the days of old when the when the sun used to disappear, the priesthood, the shaman there took credit for bringing back the sun. It's the same psychology. All right. Let me just take a break from long-windedness here and uh, just to remind you of the occultic resonance that CERN the CERN facility has in the popular imagination. And I would argue for even the scientists themselves who pretend that they're beyond religion. Here we go. And I thank you, uh, Kirby Summers, for uh, pointing me to this um, video. I mean, I've seen it. I think many of us seen it. But she was able to, because of her superior research skills, find the, the uh, video that I think had been taken down. Here it goes. Hey there, everybody. This is Scott at Standing Ground Studio. And what you're looking at on the screen is a video that was posted within the last day. And it apparently shows a blood sacrifice happening in front of the Shiva statue at CERN. Now, the full video is just under two minutes long, and I'm going to play it back in just a moment. Fair warning, though, if you're at work, maybe turn down the audio, because once the camera guy sees the sacrifice, he flips out and starts cursing up a storm. After that, I'll give you some of my insights in the video, and we'll go from there. Enjoy.
Okay, the uh, hooded, gowned people start appearing in a couple moments, and the quote-unquote human sacrifice, because I don't know if it's real or not, <laughs> takes place. <laughs> what the fuck? From there enjoy okay um the person who reposted that video claims that it was um a uh, staged event but whether it was staged or not and i'm you know i don't know myself whether it was whether it was staged or not in the imagination right remember we talked about the uh the um the thomas theorem if people perceive a situation as real then it's real in its consequence Harken back to that when you see these, whoever they were, these people there uh, enacting this occult sacrificial, this blood ritual, right? And we know that blood rituals um, do occur, right? We know it anecdotally, we know it from the annals of true crime and, uh, and in conjunction with the, uh, the um, Passover and um, uh, the solar eclipse, there's a lot of talk of the red heifer. In fact, in that Greg Reese piece that you should watch, it's in its an entirety. There's a, it concludes with with the talk in uh, uh, about the uh, the sacrifice of the red heifer, right? Supposedly sim, sim, symbolizing the golden calf or idolatry. There's all kinds of in reading about this, and I'm not an expert on it. Uh, these are some of the explanations that have been put forth. You can do that on your own. That's something that would uh, enliven classroom discussion, don't you think? Rather than talking about um, uh, racial oppression and uh, uh, sexism, real or imaginary, um, why can't we talk about the esotericism that the ruling class really um, are, are coming out? They're operating. Their operating system is one of esotericism. It's It's operating on the basis of secrecy. Right. That is a sociological, anthropological fact, Jack. All right. And that's going to open up. I want to keep it on the positive here. Okay. Let me, since I've been holding you so long here, and I thank you for your your loyalty <laughs> in sticking in, I'm going to um, conclude here uh, by stating again that I think tomorrow's eclipse, it's real. I'm not denying that. It's not a mass hallucination. It's not a hologram. Uh, nothing like that. Uh, it's not mass hypnosis, right? But it is an exercise in engineered social cohesion. It's an engineered social cohesion exercise. Whatever happens, whatever happens, the people who are giving us all the warnings and put their little brand on it, Courtesy of NASA, courtesy of DHS, it is it is social cohesion and a sense of wonder and peace and fulfillment and wholeness that Carl Jung spoke about in such glowing terms that many human beings seek. We want that, right? But it's going to come to you courtesy of this dictatorship of CERN, right? Because none of us have any input on their experiments, their agenda, or what they're doing, right? Where's where's this notion of, of governance? Where does that come into play here? Again, eclipse as engineered social cohesion exercise. All right, I can go on and on, but I think that's enough to, <laughs> to uh, tax your mind for, for now. I'll take some of these articles and I'll post it on my Patreon so you can read them at your leisure. 
and hopefully you can have a discussion with your family and others. And you can really cohere amongst them yourselves organically without the Department of Homeland Security saying, yeah, it's okay. You can cohere. You can feel awe. You can be God-inspired. All right. You can, you can do it yourself because you're a human being. I'm a human being. We're all human beings. We're, we're lovely. <laughs> we're, we're in the image of God, right? Created in the image of God. Amen to that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, hanging in there again. I appreciate it. And perhaps I'll revisit this uh, topic uh, in the future. Um, in a future cast, I will bring, be bringing back in my friend and colleague, uh, Lena Poo, to talk about. She, she, she's, she used to work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, so she has an engineering perspective on what I've been talking about, whereas I've been dealing primarily with the metaphysical, the esoteric, and the um, the supernatural, if you will, aspects of, of tomorrow's event. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you next week, God willing, and uh, hopefully the software holds up. Thank you very much. Bye.